impressive. There you go. With that, I'll turn it right, well, I think we're in for a, a fascinating debate over what 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 ails the economy and uh, how to how to fix it. And where uh, ground rules are that we'll start with 15 minutes each. We'll start with Rob and then to Dean, and uh, then I'll ask a couple questions and try to keep the the debate going, and then we'll open it up for for questions. So. Uh, my role is basically to keep you two from, you know, getting into fisticuffs or throwing or chairs. Agree. Yeah. Or agree. Yeah, <laughs> try to, try to stick, or stimulate some debate. Rob, you want to start? You have 15 minutes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, John, and thank you again to Dean for agreeing to do this. Um, in rereading uh, Dean's book last night, which I really encourage you to read, I don't agree with everything in it, but I, I certainly actually found that I agreed with, with some of it, uh, in, in fact, more than some of it. Uh, I particularly agreed with his statement where he said, quote, in Washington, debates, debate is not necessary, debate is not necessary, a narrative, it is not necessary that a narrative be grounded in reality. And I'm like, well, that just says it all, doesn't it? Because many of the debates we have, as far as I can tell, they're reality-free zones. Uh, he made a good point about higher home prices don't make people wealthier, don't make society wealthier. They basically uh, are just a share that is accumulated by homeowners. Uh, he makes a very good point that the value of the dollar is never, hardly ever mentioned in policy debates. I thought he had a wonderful quote about how uh, few people realize that, as an, that an agency of the federal government, the Federal Reserve Board, actively throws people out of work to fight inflation. That is really a, like a nice way to frame what, what goes on when they do that. And lastly, we agree on uh, Tom Friedman, or at least uh, some of Tom Friedman's uh, op-eds. Uh, last week we both... When did, I, I got mine done by about 8.05 at the breakfast table, and... Uh, <laughs> I think I might, might have beat you there. Yeah, <laughs> you're up, you're up <laughs> earlier than I am. We've, so we both had this. But an area... We, so we agree on some things, but we don't agree, I think, on, 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 on some ways the core. Uh, and, and I think our disagreement is really about the nature of progressive economics and its validity. And just as a background, actually another area we agree on, I hope we agree on this, that this notion somehow that economics is a science and that we're all approaching objective truth. Uh, I certainly don't agree with that. I don't think Dean agrees with that. So economics is really about a set of doctrines, if you will, or, or views, worldviews that are infused with values and other types of uh, other type, other aspects that make it not a science. And one form of economics is progressive economics. And I would argue that progressive economics evolved from Keynesianism in the 30s. Uh, and uh, it, it added certain components, uh, but essentially it is a doctrine uh, that may have suited post-war America, uh, but I don't believe it suits the kind of world that we live in today, the kind of economy we live in. In post-war America, growth pretty much took care of itself. You didn't have to have an economic doctrine that looked, how do you get more growth? It just sort of happened. Uh, it was an economic doctrine that worked when businesses faced little international competition. Uh, we didn't really care uh, if we imposed slightly higher taxes on companies or a little bit more regulatory burden. They weren't really going anywhere. But I would argue that progressive economics has failed to come to grips with these new realities. We face intense global competition. We can't take growth for granted. We've seen that uh, certainly in the last in the last decade. So where do I think progressive economics falls down? I would articulate or suggest four fundamental points. Now this first one may sound a little funny because uh, it actually we're in the midst of uh, the worst business cycle in uh, 75 years, but progressive economics, to the extent it thinks about growth, it thinks about it in the business cycle context. And in that sense, what it's really saying is that the growth rate, there's this top line kind of maximal output that the economy can ever achieve. And the role of policy is to make sure that capacity utilization and full employment stays close to that line. In other words, it's really all about making sure that we don't have parts of the business cycle that underproduce relative to what the economy can produce at full employment. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That's useful and important, as we're seeing right now. But it's not a growth policy. It's not trying to get that top line to grow even faster. It's just trying to get as close to that natural rate of growth. To the extent that progressive economics focuses on growth, it is a demand-side policy. That's why when 
people talked about supply side economics in the late 70s. That was such a revolution because they were saying it's the supply side of the economy that's important. Now, you don't have to be a conservative supply sider in, the, in, in, in that sense to think that the supply side is important, as we do, but it's very different than saying that growth comes from stimulating demand. Third, uh, progressive economics is not really a growth theory. It, it has no theory about growth. It's principally a redistribution theory. And lastly, it has an ambiguous view at best about globalization. And I think that's a challenge given how globalized the economy is. So I want to go through just two core points of that rather than focus on all of them. And number one about growth is demand driven. Uh, it's clear, and this is where Dean and I would agree, uh, that people who would argue that now is the time to cut spending, uh, I would say this is, uh, this is completely fallacious. You don't cut spending when the recovery is so anemic. Uh, you try to get fiscal discipline when you're on a pretty upward path for recovery, not when you're in a very tenuous place, which is where we are now. But demand is not the only story, but I would argue progressive economics, progressive economists think it is. I sort of question whether Krugman's progressive economics or neoclassicalist, but sometimes he's one or the other, or both. But Krugman recently said, quote, the fa all the facts suggest that high unemployment in America is the result of inadequate demand full stop. So if that's what you believe, then other types of explanations, for example, uh, the fact that we are really lagging in international competitiveness, the la fact that we lost more jobs in the last decade in manufacturing than in the Great Depression, and that was related to economic competitiveness, those aren't demand side questions, those are supply side questions. And a lot of progressives would say, really, this is just about demand, just stimulate the economy, get more spending, perhaps do some tax cuts on, the indi on individuals, on you know, things like payroll taxes, and voila, the recovery will happen. Uh, but it's not just that progressives say that we should have high spending during downturns. It's almost been institutionalized that it's important to have high spending at all times because growth comes from demand. So for example, former Economic Policy Institute President Jeff Foe has written, that a key role of the federal government is to, quote, jumpstart consumer demand and through its spending keep it up. So in other words, there's this view there that, that, that if the government isn't constantly spending, that consumer demand will fall and that companies won't invest. And let me just suggest, I, I think that the evidence suggests that that's, that's not that's not accurate view of how growth occurs. Most of the growth accounting models suggest that it's uh, really on the supply side and it's on the supply side related to innovation. That it's innovation, it's about companies developing new products, new processes, new business models. That's where we get higher per capita income growth. That's where we get higher productivity, new products, which is really all about, which is what growth is all about. The second big uh, area I think that progressive economics stands for, and that's about essentially what you might say redistribution and protection. Progressives believe that the government must ensure that capitalism, capitalism's excesses are managed and its limitations are addressed. Uh, in that sense, the government's role is to regulate corporations by enacting labor, environmental, product safety laws to ensure a strong social safety net. Uh, and that this pantheon of progressive accomplishments, Medicare, Medicaid, the war on poverty, environmental laws, consumer protection laws, these are all steps that they uh, can rightfully be proud of that are focused on, this, so, uh, focused on addressing abuses of markets. Now you can have a debate whether those things are good, whether they're bad, whether they've passed their prime, whether they need reform. That's not what this is about. My point is much simpler. Those are not growth policies. And if an economic doctrine today wants to be viable as a political movement, as, as an intellectual uh, alternative, it has to have a narrative about growth and competitiveness. That is not a narrative about growth or competitiveness. And in that context, progressives focus much of their effort on lessening income inequalities. Uh, Dean's book, uh, again, I encourage you to read that, uh, the first sentences of his book, End of Loser Liberalism, are, quote, money does not fall up, yet the United States has experienced a massive upward distribution of income over the last three decades. Now, again, you can have a debate about whether it's massive, whether it's moderate, 
I don't think you can have a debate about whether it's increased. I think that evidence is very, very clear inequality increased, and our own view is we should take steps to address it. I think there we agree with Dean. But again, that's not a growth agenda. That is not creating a larger GDP at a faster rate than what we were going to get through natural market forces. That's simply taking, here's what the GDP is, we're going to make sure it's, it's, it's allocated in a more fair uh, and equitable way. So in, my, uh, in the counter to my article in Breakthrough Journal, Dean uh, listed several points where he asserted that actually progressive economics had a growth agenda. And let me list two of them and suggest that it's not a growth agenda. One of the areas that Dean um, mentioned was um, that we could save an enormous amount of money. I think his quote was 90% of money spent on drugs uh, if drugs were sold in a free market, which is uh, his definition of that is with no patent protection. In other words, make all drugs generics. You absolutely would reduce the price of drugs. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. If, if you took all drugs off patent protection, we see that when drugs move from regular to generic, prices go down because he's right. It doesn't cost a lot sometimes to make drugs, at least, at least non-biologics. But again, that leaving aside whether that's good or bad, and, and we would argue it's bad, but uh, it certainly would have some ill effect on pr producing revenues for some pharmaceutical companies who then have to take that money and invest in developing uh, new drugs through R&D and other types of things, many of which do not pay off. But leave that aside. Uh, the end result is simply redistribution. So it's not as if the economy is bigger after that. It's that some people pay less for drugs and some on the other side who would make drugs get less money. So that's just a transfer payment from one group in society to another group. It's not a growth agenda. Dean argues the same for ending copyright protection. He quote, quote he says, uh, the copyright monopoly, uh, well the monopoly which is copyright, allows companies to charge large sums for software, recorded music, and video material that would be available at no cost in a free market. Uh, now again, let's just say that's true and everybody can go to Pirate Bay uh, and get all their music, movies, and uh, software, which you can do now, by the way, but it's illegal. But now we've made it legal. Now you can go to Pirate Bay and get everything you want. Certainly, consumers now would be better off, if you will, in the short run. They don't have, I don't have to pay for Windows anymore. I can get the new Windows operating system without paying. Uh, clearly, consumers would be better off in the short run. Now, the question is, in the long run, they wouldn't be because I would be using the same. I'd be using Windows. My son and my grandson would be using Windows 7 uh, because there would be no Windows 19. In other words, there wouldn't be innovation because you don't have any money and revenues to reinvest in the next generation of music, movies, or songs. But again, even <coughs> leaving that aside, that's still a transfer payment. That is still moving money from one group to another. It's not making the overall economy bigger. If I get my Windows operating system for free, Microsoft gets less money, I keep my money. Again, not a growth policy. So at the end of the day, the only way to make an economy more, the only way to make an economy larger is through either productivity or innovation, i.e. new products and services. So the economy is larger today because we have 4G cell phones. Uh, we, have a, we have value that we didn't have before. The economy is larger today because companies adopt IT and become more productive and more efficient. But that is clearly disruptive. Uh, this kind of change is about is what Schumpeter called creative destruction. Not everybody is always helped by these kinds of changes. Uh, buggy whip makers were really hurt when we built autos. Uh, people who worked at blockbuster stores were really hurt when, uh, when we went to uh, video delivery uh, on, on the internet of movies. And yet progressives essentially don't really want to embrace or accept that kind of creative destruction. They want to have an economy that somehow grows magically without that sort of disruption. Now again, in, in one level, their goal or their, their, their motivation is a good one. They don't want to have workers hurt. Absolutely a good motivation. But at the end of the day, if we're all doing the same jobs, if my son is doing the exact same jobs that we're doing today, you can't grow an economy. There's a reason we don't have 75% of Americans as farmers, and it's a really good thing. Because if 75% of farmers, uh, Americans were farmers, we wouldn't have cars, we wouldn't have big houses, we wouldn't have cell phones. So ultimately, I would argue that progressive economics has got to embrace that kind of creative destruction, and they don't. So let me just close by saying, 
progressive, the progressive canon basically lacks a coherent and credible theory for how we spur productivity, innovation, and competitiveness. It doesn't lack a coherent theory for how we achieve fairness, stability, protection. That is its strong point, but it does lack this other theory. Now, just so I'm clear, I don't think neoclassical economics has much of a theory either. They, they have a theory, it's just a very bankrupt and uh, inaccurate theory of how do you get growth. So I'm not comparing progressive economics to somehow neoclassical economics, which is what most people in Washington who are economists practice. But they have an excuse. Uh, their excuse is they just think the market magically generates growth and that anything the government does is going to make it worse, not better. Uh, progressives don't have that excuse. Progressives are, in the terminology, in institutionalists. They don't have a fetish about the market being all-knowing and all-perfect. Uh, so they're willing to intervene. Uh, they just don't want to intervene for spurring growth, spurring innovation, productivity, and competitiveness. I have six seconds left. So I will just say, in closing, uh, that really I would, what, what needs to happen is progressive economics needs to offer a credible way forward and that the, for the U.S. economy. And the only way to do that is with significant uh, intellectual revision, particularly around the role of companies uh, through innovation and productivity. Thank you very much. to poke some holes in those arguments. Okay, Rob, I want to destroy the pharmaceutical industry, the entertainment industry, and the software industry, and I don't believe in creative destruction. Okay, well, thanks for setting this up. I really do enjoy it. I appreciate this. And uh, thanks also, to John. Uh, it's great to have a chance to exchange views like this, and particularly we're engaging in our print debates, so it's good to actually do it in person. All right, what I want to do, I say, I find... The whole argument, I said this in my print thing, I'll say it in person, that I find the whole argument a little bit strange in the sense that we are very much in a demand-constrained situation. So it's a little strange to me to, to make the argument against Keynes, Keynesianism, demand economics right now. And I'll go through that. I mean, it, to my mind, it's a little bit like we, you know, we, I, and a few others, I'll put my buddy Paul Krugman in the camp with me whether he wants to be there or not. We were talking about this years ago, and things are happening just as we expected, and now we're being told, hey, you're all wrong. Okay, maybe, but that's not the way we usually think of things. Then I do want to talk about the supply side because I, I think that, you know, again, I don't know if I could speak for all progressive economists, but um, I think Rob only gave you half the picture. I think we do have to talk about the supply side, and at least I do, and at least some other progressive economists do. All right, well, first off, you know, why do we have, you know, so many people out of work today, 8.5% unemployment, why are we in this big slump? The economy was being driven by a housing bubble. This is not 2020 hindsight. I was talking about this in 2002, jumping up and down. We have a really big housing bubble. It's driving the economy. It drives it two ways. One, through consumption, you know, because you have all this equity in your home and you spend based on that. That's really old doctrine, neoclassical economics. Secondly, directly through construction. You know, and it was easy to see this was not going to continue. It lasted longer than I expected, but, you know, it was not going to continue indefinitely because the prices didn't make sense. Bubbles eventually burst. I didn't expect all the fraud, all the crazy stuff we eventually saw, 05, 06, the peak of the bubble, so it went on longer than I expected. But the basic story was 100% predictable, okay? And also, the fact that it would be hard to recover from a bubble, that was, again, 100% predictable. A typical recession, Fed raises interest rates that causes people to stop buying cars, stop buying houses. Then easy way to get things going again, lower interest rates, okay? Pent up demand for cars, pent up demand for houses. People go out and buy them. So if you look, we had bad recessions in 74, 75, 81, 82. Fed turns it around on a dime. They lower interest rates. Big uptick because people start buying houses, buying cars. Could not happen here. That wasn't the cause of the downturn. 100% predictable. So we're going, well, why are things so bad? Well, we told you. We told you beforehand. Okay, the stimulus. Stimulus didn't work. Well, guess what? You know, Krugman could cite this. I could cite this. Someone sent me a note I'd forgotten about. I wrote a column back in January of 2009, just after Obama came out with the stimulus. I go, not big enough. He'll be lucky if it gets us halfway to full employment. Of course, Congress didn't give him everything he asked for, so maybe it got us third of the way, fourth of the way. Um, basic story, we lost somewhere in the order of $600 billion in demand from residential construction. Disappeared. We lost somewhere around $600 billion in demand from consumption. People lost all this equity in their home. They stopped buying things, 100% um, predictable. We had a bubble in non-residential real estate. That was about $100 billion because of the loss of revenue. State and local governments had to cut back, again, around $100 billion. You add up, you're talking about $1.4 trillion, somewhere around $1.4 trillion in annual demand. How large was the stimulus? Well, you know, you get rid of the alternative minimum tax that 
had nothing to do with stimulus. You know, you go, okay, well, it was about seven hundred billion. Some of that was spent in two thousand eleven. Some of them will still be spent in later years. It was roughly six hundred billion over two years. Okay, so that comes to three hundred billion a year. Surprise, surprise! Three hundred billion in stimulus was not enough to replace one point four trillion in lost demand. No surprises. Okay, it wasn't big enough. So, I mean, to my mind, when we just talk about the basic story of you know, why do we have a real big unemployment problem? Why are we still so far below the economy's potential? Um, you know, to my mind, that's all very straightforward. Um, we simply lack that demand, and you can't create it out of air. You know, we might want to. I mean, there's a lot of Republicans, I'm not putting Rob in this camp, but there's a lot of Republicans go, we want the private sector to do it. Good. I want the private sector to do it too, but it's not going to. People don't create jobs. They don't start investing because we want them to. They do that when, we, when they see demand. And one of the striking parts of the story, actually, is investment's actually doing reasonably well. If you look at investment in equipment and software, it's almost back to its 2007 share of GDP. In other words, it's almost back to the pre-crisis level, which is quite striking given how much excess capacity we have in many areas of the economy. So I actually look at this, and I, I read the research a little differently. I've seen a lot of research on investment demand, and it shows that the main factor is, first and foremost, uh, growth to demand profits. Those are the main factors. So when firms see rapidly growing demand, they tend to invest, which to my mind seems pretty reasonable. You know, And again, there's a lot of evidence to back that up. One of my favorite, uh, there's a lot of micro research on this is done in part by a friend of mine, Steve Fazari at the University of Washington. What I always like about this is one of his co-authors, this is about 20 years ago now, was Glenn Hubbard, who some of you might know as George W. Bush's chief economic advisor. So I always like to cite that one. Okay. Um, Supply side. Um, Rob gave you part of the picture. I want to talk about three areas where, well, I'll talk about supply side. I could talk about others, but I just want to talk about three. One is the drug patents. We can get a little bit into the copyrights. Second, uh, trade and professional services. I'll focus on health care here, but we can talk about trade more generally. And third, a financial, financial speculation tax. And that may sound strange to use the supply side doctrine, but I'll explain it in a moment. Um, first off, drugs. Um, Rob just gave you half the story. Um, yes, I want drugs to be sold in a competitive market, a free market. You know, patents are incredibly inefficient. But I also want the government to finance drug research. If that sounds bizarre to you, then you haven't heard of National Institutes of Health. $30 billion a year. We do finance biomedical research. Um, I would have us pick up the rest of the tab. And it could be done through Pfizer and Merck. I don't care. You know, contract it out. That's great. But the point is, have everything in the public domain. Have it in the public domain in two ways. One hand, when you have the research results, have that in the public domain so everyone could see them. Other researchers could take advantage of them. Doctors could take advantage of them. Secondly, have the patents in the public domain. You have so much waste, and this is increasing supply because you have God knows how much waste. We spend $300 billion a year. 2% of GDP goes into drugs that would cost us $30 billion a year in a free market. And, you know, if any of you ever had to deal with this, my wife had a chronic disease. We have way better insurance, I'm sure, than 90% of the population. We've had to waste so much of our time getting insurance companies to pay for drugs that they're supposed to pay for. This is an incredible waste. That is supply side. That's a really big supply side. In fact, if anyone knows anything that has more impact on supply side, I'd love to hear it because I never have. Okay, 2% of GDP. Okay, so I'm not talking about not financing research. I'm talking about financing research through a different mechanism. And frankly, I'd be hard-pressed to imagine a more inefficient mechanism than what we have now. A very large amount of what the drug companies spend goes for copycat research. They're not trying to find a better drug to cure a disease or a condition that isn't already there, they're trying to do the 13th calcium channel blocker and take advantage of the fact that they have a really good distribution network, they've got a lot of attractive people that go around to doctors and push drugs that don't do any good, that is an incredible waste. That's what you have now. And half the time you're getting drugs, you know, it doesn't take long, you know, read the New York Times for next month, I'll be surprised. You don't see a story about a drug that turns out is either ineffective or harmful, and the drug company knew it, but they concealed the evidence. Why? Because they get lots of money for doing that. Okay, this is an incredibly inefficient system. I want to make it more efficient. Okay, second point. Uh, oh, let me jump on uh, copyrights, too, because there, too. Um, uh, you know, I, I thought the stop online piracy is a great example of exactly what I'm talking about. Incredible waste. We, here we have this great device, the Internet. We can get all this stuff. We can get music. We can get software. We can get movies all free, instantly, all over the world. So what are, what, what are we trying to do as a matter of policy? Bottle it up. Okay, that is really backward. That is a bad supply-side policy. I have an alternative mechanism. I talk about having different public funding. Um, I, you know, my book's available free. Uh, how well we're funded is another question. But, you know, the, the point is there's a lot of alternative ways to finance 
artistic and creative work. Some of that's already there. A lot of people are, you have university faculty, we have government funding. There's lots of different sources. We have the charitable tax deduction. Basically, my proposal is to make that bigger and um, have, it, have that available, basically a credit, $100 credit for people. But again, we could go through that. The point is there are alternative mechanisms. So I'm not talking about not funding it. If, if you got that impression, you didn't read carefully enough. I'm talking about a different way to fund it. And my argument is that the current way of funding, it's incredibly inefficient. I mean, talk about being archaic. Copyright dates back from the you know 16th century in Venice. It might have been great for back then, but it's not really good for the Internet age. So we're a little backward if we're still thinking copyright's a really good way to finance creative and artistic work. Um, okay, trade. Um, we've had a real focus on freeing up trade. It just drives me nuts that we, we talk about free trade deals. Well, one, a lot of our, our free trade deals, if you look at NAFTA or the pact we just signed with Korea, or really all the, all the deals, a major part of that is about increasing patent and copyright protection, which has nothing to do with free trade. That's protectionism. You know, again, you could like it. You could say it's good policy. I mean, that's fine, but it's not free trade. I mean, it's utterly absurd. It's the exact opposite. You're extending monopolies. But one of the things that we really haven't freed up trade in is professional services. It's very difficult for a foreign doctor, they could train to U.S. standards, very difficult for them to come to the United States and practice medicine. When we signed NAFTA, what that was about, we got General Motors, General Electric, we said, what makes it difficult for you to set up a plant in, in, in Mexico? You know, and they said, well, we're worried they might repatriate, they, they might put restrictions on repatriating profits. They might nationalize, you know, this and that. So NAFTA was about giving them a secure environment so you could plop your plant down in Mexico. You didn't have to worry about anything. That was the whole point of it. It was about putting U.S. manufacturing workers in direct contact competition with workers in Mexico. We could argue whether that was good or bad, but that was what it was about. Okay, why didn't we do the same for our doctors, our lawyers, our economists? Why didn't we go to the hospitals and go, how come you don't, you know, we can get... Doctors from Mexico, a fraction of the price, they'd love to come here and practice for 100000 a year, half the wages of our doctors. We didn't do that. We didn't say, what are the obstacles? None of our trade agreements do we do that. I want us to do that. Okay, I want free trade and professional services, a great supply-side policy. You know, just you know, just taking our doctors. If our doctors got the same pay as doctors in West Europe, save us 100000 a doctor, that's roughly $100 billion a year, almost twice the size of what's at stake with the Bush tax cuts for, for high-end individuals. Okay, I'd like to have free trade and professional services. That's both affect income inequality, sure. You know, we wouldn't see doctors, a lot of the one percent are doctors. We wouldn't see as many doctors in the top one percent. Um, but also it would be it would be hugely a uh, huge gain in efficiency. Um, I would argue more generally, I'd like to have more trade in health care. Why can't people take Medicare and you know go to countries that have much lower we pay more than twice as much per person for our health care as people in, in Canada and Germany pick your country? Why don't we let people on Medicare go to those countries and split the savings? Okay, have some competition. What's wrong with that? I, I, I love to talk to them. my buddies at Cato. I go, what's wrong with giving people a choice? You know, if you look at the projections, the, those gaps are huge. I think the projections are crazy, but what the hell? We all make policy on them in Washington. So if you're going to take the projections seriously when you yell about the deficit, you know, 10, 20, 30 years out, well, then let's take the projections seriously when we talk about what I call Medicare vouchers. You know, let people go to these other countries, take advantage of lower cost health care, put a lot of money in their pocket. Okay, so that I consider very much a supply side policy. Medicare health care is projected to be 20% of, of the economy in 10 years. Um, we could cut that down hugely. That looks like supply side to me. If that's not supply side, I really don't know what is. Um, last point I was going to make, um, financial speculation tax. So that sounds like straight out redistribution, right? That's uh, you know just taking from, from the rich people on Wall Street and giving it to, to the rest of us, which it is. But it's also about more than that. Um, the, the financial sector is incredibly wasteful. It's a waste of resources. And if you look at the financial sector relative to the rest of the economy, it's quintupled over the last three decades. Okay, so relative to the size of the economy, it's five times as large today as it was back in the 70s. Okay, well, what are we getting for that? You know, again, this is an attack on the financial sector in the sense that I realize we need a financial sector. We want a place to be able to put our savings to, to uh, obviously we need uh, to have checking accounts, saving accounts, all that. We need to be able to borrow if we want to go to college, to buy a house, to start a business, all those things. So we need a financial sector. But the point is we want an efficient financial sector. An efficient financial sector is one that you, does not use a lot of resources. We do not have that. Okay, we might have had one in the 70s. We don't have one today. It takes up five times as much resources. Okay, so what am I saying about the financial speculation tax? Well, we'll whittle down the financial sector in size. We'll use a lot less resources. 
Um, we could play at different levels. You know, the one there's one now before the the House and Senate by proposed by uh, Senator Harkin and, and uh, Representative Fazio. It's very small, just three one hundredths of percent. Um, I proposed one uh, with my friend Robert Poland, half of one percent on stock trades, much lower on uh, shorter lived assets. Uh, we we calculate it could raise somewhere in the order of one hundred fifty billion dollars a year. But one of the things that's really nice about that, at least in my view, is that almost all of that would come directly out of the financial sector in the sense that you would reduce the volume of trading by roughly that amount. So you, you're you'd be gaining a revenue directly by eliminating resources in the financial sector. Point here is that people who are working in the financial sector, I'm not going to say they're all smart, but at least some of them are. Um, they could be doing useful things, and many of them are not. They're playing games, they're developing things like dead peasant insurance policies, I'll be happy to explain that to you later, um, developing things that are basically uh, tax and, and regulatory arbitrage, simply rent-seeking and serve no productive purpose. Okay, well, I could go on. I have, am happy to go on. I'll encourage you to look at my book, which is not copyrighted, so I'm not getting a commission on that. But the point is there are lots of ways in which, at least I, I'm not going to attribute this to all progressive economists, have talked about affecting the supply side. I agree with Rob. It's very important. We do want to affect the supply side. I'd say most immediately, though, I would say the media problem for the economy is demand. I just take one more issue, I have a few seconds left here, with one of the things Rob said. He talked about the natural market forces. One of my main points when I talk about economics is there are no natural market forces. We shape the market forces. And what's gone on over the last three decades is that we have shaped, by conscious policy, market forces in ways that redistribute income upwards. What I want to focus on as a progressive economist is how do we change that so market forces redistribute income to the rest of us. So that's both a growth policy and a distribution policy. Thanks. And, uh, how do you respond, Rod? I mean, it sounds like Dean's got some very innovative, promoting ideas. How would they differ from yours? Well, let me just first of all uh, go a little bit in the order of what Dean said. So um, I hope Dean understood that, first of all, I agree 100% on the stimulus. I, it was too small. Um, that is part of the reason why we haven't had the recovery as, as much. Uh, <clears throat> So I don't, it's not like I'm saying somehow that Keynesianism in a, in a downturn is not an appropriate policy. It absolutely is an appropriate policy. Although I was kind of more of a Schumpeterian Keynesian where I actually liked a lot of the stimulus being things that we get a double hit for. We, we build a road and employ construction workers and get long-term growth out of it too. Um, and, and, you know, Dean talked about the bubble and all. I, and I give Dean a lot of credit for identifying the bubble. Uh, I, I think that was... Well, I shouldn't actually give you credit because it was sort of obvious, but it, it, should, have been. <laughs> <laughs> should have been. Uh, you know, but Greenspan <laughs> didn't identify it, so Dean uh, got it right. Um, but the more interesting question to me is why did we have this bubble? Uh, and, and that's where I don't think progressive economics gets it right. We had that bubble because money was flowing. First of all, we had excess money coming into the economy because we were running a huge trade deficit. China had all this money, they were looking for a home for it. It went into the U.S. And then there was not enough real avenues to invest that money in. As, as Stephen and as Elle and I point out in this new book we have that will be coming out in September, The Race for Global Innovation Advantage, the, the real opportunities for wealth investment in the U.S., in other words, things like capital expenditures, uh, R&D, IPOs, all of those things that normally Wall Street took money and put it into these wealth-producing, productivity, innov innovation-producing things really went down. And so they had all this money, and Wall Street if they were a normal industry, would have downsized, uh, but they're not a normal industry, so they couldn't downsize and wouldn't downsize, so they decided to put it into this Ponzi scheme. Clearly, it's a Ponzi scheme, and Dean got that right. The question is, why did the Ponzi scheme occur? And that's where I think progressive economics doesn't get the story right, because they don't look at the underlying part of the economy. So, all right, so going back to, this, uh, to some of his, his quote, uh, supply sites, I uh, think, uh, it's not clear to me how uh, it's, it's inefficient. Uh, how is it efficient to fund Mission Impossible? Everybody saw the new Mission Impossible movie where Tom Cruise is going on the outside of the building in Kuwait. I don't think you can fund that movie with donations from tax exempt. Uh, I'm going to give Tom Cruise or whoever the producer is, you know, I'm going to give him 20 bucks and so hopefully he'll make Mission Impossible. The reason that is such a cool movie, uh, you know, you can like it or not, but it is a movie with incredible special effects that cost an you know, enormous amount of money to make 
is because they know that they're going to get copyright protection, at least in the U.S. and France and a bunch of countries, not in China, for, by no stretch of the imagination in China. But we'd have more Mission Impossibles, and we'd have better software and more of it if we had copyright protection. Uh, on the NIH thing, um, yeah, sure, there's, there's, there's duplicative research in every single industry in the U.S. economy. But somehow to say that we can know what is the wrong research, what's the right research, and somehow if we can sort of allocate that the right way, I just, I find that uh, worrisome. I just don't, I, this is where I actually do think the market can get it right. Um, the market failure is probably worse, uh, less than the government failure here. Also, I, while NIH is critically important and we should, uh, and on our position is we need to increase NIH funding, uh, NIH funding is not a substitute, it's a complement for drug research. They're not the same thing. Uh, and I don't think they can be. Um, the point about professionals, uh, I agree with that. We, we've actually been a leading think tank on removing restrictions for professionals, uh, auto dealers, real estate agents, doctors, uh, a whole set of things, optometrists, who have used professional codes to keep away competition and to gain rents uh, against consumers. Absolutely agree with that. Uh, but. That policy, Dean, what you're talking about, of being able to offshore uh, or import our medical services or other kind or economic services or anything like that, that is not a growth policy. That is a redistribution policy. So yes, I, it's not Mexican. If Mexican doctors were somehow more efficient, okay, that's a, that's a growth policy. Mexican doctors are not more efficient than American doctors. They may be less, but they're certainly not more efficient. The only reason it saves money is because Mexican doctors just will, are willing to take less money than an American doctor. So you're not changing the healthcare system. You're not making the healthcare system more inherently productive. You're just lowering the wages of doctors. We could have the exact same result if we force doctors to take half the money that they make now. We just force doctors to cut their salary in half. We could then improve consumers, but you would hurt doctors. So to me, that's not a supply side policy. Uh, because it doesn't unfundamentally change the production process, it doesn't fundamentally lead to innovation. Uh, with regard to the Tobin tax, which is I think what you're referring to, uh, I, I'm not a big expert on the Tobin tax, but but I'd say my inclination is I kind of like it. Uh, I haven't studied enough to take a formal position. I kind of like it, partly because it does get at a big market failure there, which which we we do allocate too much money to this sector. And if we took it out, we'd get these people going to science and engineering and. We have less of just less weight, so I don't disagree with that part of it. But I, I think fundamentally, you can't have a supply side policy by just sort of doing some redistribution in a few industries. It's got to be how do we get all industries to be adopting more technology, more innovation, and that's what I just don't hear. So, okay, a few things. First off, let, let's just say where we do agree uh, the stimulus, yeah, I would have loved to see more spending in infrastructure investment. I mean, one of the things that was just, to my mind, almost no brainer is retrofitting buildings. Pay for itself. We know how to do it. This isn't high tech. I mean, I'm all for high tech, but this is a guaranteed return. So, you know, we spend money on things that are more speculative, but also let's take the guaranteed return. And it's just unfortunate you couldn't get mo more money for that. Is your mic on? Uh, can you press that? Yeah, great. Can't even work the, techno the, the mic technology here. Okay, uh, a couple points here. Just to clarify the, this point about drugs and patent protection. Um, again, you know, the government is not picking winners. You're happy, I'm happy to, I would want a contract out, I'll be very clear. What I would envision is something like a period of long-term contracts. You put out chunks of money, let's say it's $40 billion a year over the next decade, so $400 billion. You have companies bid for it, say we're going to do this, that, and that. They get a contract for eight years, 10 years, 12 years, and then, you know, basically master contracts because presumably they wouldn't do it all in-house. Pfizer doesn't do theirs in-house for the most part. Um, and then at the end of that period, they'll presumably want to get renewed, and you see what, what they've done. Um, now, in terms of incentive, so, so you're not, government's not picking which drugs to research. Now, the reason why I expect that to be, to be much better is because right now people do research to get patent rents, and that would make no sense in this system. So we have a calcium channel block blocker. Do you go and develop another one? Well, that would make no sense unless you really think it's going to be qualitatively better than the existing one because it's already there. You won't get any credit for it. You wouldn't waste a lot of resources on it. So you've changed the incentives in a way that will lead to much more efficiency. Um, the artistic freedom voucher system, well, we're speculating here. I propose that as competition with the copyright system. And, you know, again, there's nothing, no reason at all that, you know, just do the arithmetic, say it's 100 bucks a person just for simplicity, 200 million people throw money out there, you'd have 20 billion a year to support creative and artistic work. That's way more than what you have now. And I would expect that a lot of that would go to intermediaries that might, you know, say, hey, we're going to have, who was it that you had in there? Uh, I don't know my actors well enough. Whoever we're going to Tom Cruise. We're going to Tom Cruise. That's right. He's going to be climbing on the the buildings and 
wherever he was climbing up buildings. You know, and so, so you all should give us your hundred dollars, and they might raise five hundred million dollars. They might raise a billion dollars because people go, "That's really cool. I want to have that." You know, so I don't see why we wouldn't have that under this. I don't know we would, but you know, let's see what happens. Let it be in competition. You have the two side by side. I'm all for the free market here. Um, in terms of the, the, the bubble economy, I, I see no mystery. I, one of my earlier books, Rise and Fall of the Bubble Economy, and I tell this story, I'm not the only one who tells it, kind of the virtuous circle story that you have this period from the post-war period into the 70s where you had good productivity growth, productivity was passed on in wages, led to consumption, that increased demand, firms invested, on and on. More productivity, wages, great, wonderful. Ends with Reagan. Okay, we have, on the one hand, a very anti-union policy, weakens workers' power. We have very high unemployment. We have a high dollar policy that whacks industries like auto and steel, traditionally uh, the core of the union, uh, union economy. And at that point, wages no longer track productivity growth. Frees up a lot of money to go into speculation. In the 90s, it goes in a stock bubble. In the last decade, it goes in a housing bubble. All that seems perfectly straight Keynesianism to me. Um, so I'm, I'm asking, what am I trying to explain? It seems all very, very straightforward. Uh, the China story, I mean, I have a very different take on the China story. Uh, China, I don't think, uh, let me put it this way, if they're looking, if they, they think they're getting a good return on their investment by putting it in U.S. Treasury bonds, uh, I don't think they're very bright, and I do think they're bright people. Um, I think what they're doing is quite deliberately keeping up the value of the dollar so that we have very large trade deficits. Um, no one forces them to do this. They do this because they want to run large trade surpluses with the United States as a, as a deliberate development strategy, which, you know, it's hard to quarrel with. 10% growth for three decades is pretty damn good. But, you know, it's not very good for the U.S. And, you know, I would argue very strongly that we need to get the dollar down, and that should really be front and center in negotiations with China. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they can make as many copies as windows as they want. You know, let's get the dollar down, get our manufacturing competitive again. So I'd really put that very much front and center. So I don't see there's really a mystery to be explained from a Keynesian perspective. That all seems very straightforward. And, you know, the dollar, as I say, I think that really is very, very central. You mentioned something about that at the beginning of your talk, that, you know, when we talk about U.S. competitiveness, the value of the currency is really front and center. And, you know, I wrote a thing about Obama's, President Obama's speech the other night at the State of the Union address. He's talking about manufacturing built to last. He didn't say a damn thing about the dollar. And as much as I liked a lot of what he said, you know, improving infrastructure, improving education, training, all very good things, um, if you don't get the dollar down to a more competitive level, you're just speaking empty air. Because that's going to dwarf, you know, if we get the dollar down by 20%, that's going to dwarf the impact of everything else President Obama was proposing. So let's get the dollar down. Let's do the things he's proposing too, or at least many of them. But if you don't get the dollar down, you're wasting time. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm struck by the, the balance here between redistribution, equity in the economy, and uh, innovative growth. I can't... Does one preclude the other? Are there innovative promoting policies that don't, that are fair, that don't necessarily cause more of this, uh, the uh, you know, benefits only for the wealthy? Well, no, as I, as my colleague Steve Rose, uh, who I think Dean knows quite well, uh, wrote a piece for us a few years ago called, Does Productivity Still Benefit the Average American Worker? And Steve took on uh, what I think has become almost standard fare now that productivity doesn't help workers. And so you see a wide swath of the left, and I'm not saying Dean has said this, that basically we really shouldn't even be focusing on productivity because it all goes to the wealthy and therefore workers don't benefit. Why bother? And in fact, the evidence that Steve uh, cites in his report says just that workers do benefit from productivity. So I think that it's really a question. So, so a few years ago, Gene Sperling wrote a book called uh, The Pro-Growth Progressive, I think was the title of the book after he left the Clinton Foundation. And, Dean, and, and, and you know, his book was an attempt to try to put together progressivism and growth, but at the end of the day, there's still a fundamental choice you got to make. you got to say one is more important than the other, and I would argue Gene, Gene sort of still tilted towards the, the redistribution side and not the growth side. I think the growth side is so important and we are missing it so badly, in part because if we, if we can't get the growth side right, we are going to continue to lose competitiveness. I mean, why did we lose the 33%, 32% of our manufacturing jobs? It wasn't because the rich were making too much money, because we didn't have a national competitiveness strategy around manufacturing. Which, by the way, I have to say, I 100% agree with Dean. I, uh, the dollar is such an obvious no-brainer uh, that one has to focus on, and the president hasn't done it, and I, I, I think it's a mistake. 
I, would, I wouldn't say, though, that it's the only thing. Uh, the fact that the Chinese steal Microsoft software and other software and IP is a huge, huge deal. Uh, and um, we ought to do it. Last thing, by the way, is, uh, you know, if this is such a great model of this kind of voluntary model, why isn't everybody using Linux? Uh, you can get a Linux operating system for completely free. Uh, why isn't everybody using Firefox? I use Firefox, but not everybody uses Firefox. Again, voluntary program. You've got to give give a little bit of money to the Mozilla Foundation. It's a nice program, but it's not 100% of the system. People are still buying software. People are buying operating systems. Uh, so this notion somehow that, that, that kind of this voluntary ecosystem would emerge. We already have voluntary ecosystems. They're already there. You're, and you're not even competing with free. You're competing with expensive. And they still they still dominate. So it's really to me it's 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 a question of, of, of focus. And the last point is there are a lot of progressives who actively oppose automation. They actively oppose companies introducing new technologies to raise productivity because they don't want to see workers laid off. Look, I don't see how you get growth unless you get automation. I don't see how we deal with the social security crisis or the looming uh, entitlement problems and the retirement bubble if the current generation of the next generation of workers is not a lot more productive. And the only way they're going to get a lot more productive is by using better machines, more machines, more automation. Uh, and that's where I really think the, the progressive economics just doesn't come to grips with that. Dean, are you standing in the way of progress? <laughs> <laughs> Depends who's progress. Um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, productivity, I I'm a big fan of productivity growth. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'll say is the productivity growth actually hasn't been that bad. So if you look at productivity growth ever since the speed up back in 95, it's averaged 2 to 2.5%. Two now, we're not quite back to the golden age levels, you know. And one of the things that actually Steve and I, you know, we've talked about a lot is that, you know, when you measure it, there's some measurement issues. So I'd still say we're about a percentage point, you know, when you measure it properly, you know, in terms of what does it actually do for well being. We're still about a percentage point lower, which is, is a gap, but we're still doing pretty well, and by international comparisons, you know, I, I, I'm used to arguing with the David Brooks and Washington Post who are saying, oh, those dumb Europeans, they're way behind us, and we're actually, you know, towards the top. I mean, so as much as I, I might try to tell the, uh, David Brooks and uh, the Post that they're wrong, um, they have some of a point in the sense that we're, we're doing better than the average across Europe and Japan. So I don't think that we're falling behind that way. Now, again, I want more. I'd rather have, us have more productivity growth, and we could work fewer hours. We could, you know, have more leisure time. Time, all sorts of great things. We want it to be distributed more fairly, but I'm all for more productivity growth. Now, just a couple points on you know on these software issues. There, there is a big difference between what I'm proposing and what we have now because you in effect be force feeding these. You got a hundred dollars, use it or lose it. So it's not just going to be your voluntary choice. You know, do you want to throw your hundred dollars in the toilet or do you want to use it to support? You like Firefox? Do it. Give it to a company that supports Firefox. Why would we think people wouldn't do that? Maybe they won't, but let's give it a try. What's wrong with market competition? Getting back to the point uh, you'd made earlier about uh, Mexican doctors, no, that is more efficient. This is exactly trade. So if we think there's gains from trade, then you have to think there's gains from getting Mexican doctors here who are willing to work for half the wages of U.S. doctors. It's the exact same argument. There's no difference between that. So, you know, if you're against trade, fine, but I don't think so. So it's literally the exact same argument. That would make the economy much more efficient. Um, last point uh, I was going to make is just that, again, in terms of, you know, going forward, uh, I think copyrights and patents, uh, you know, I think they are archaic. When we look to China, again, my point in saying I'll let them do what they want with Microsoft, two reasons. One is when you go to negotiate with China, we don't give them a laundry list and say do X, Y, and Z. We might be able to do that with Honduras, we can't do that with China. You have trade-offs. So if we're going to get them to respect Microsoft's patents, that means, or copyrights, that means less ground on the currency. Um, the other point is, again, just from a straight neoclassical economics vantage point, if they're sending us a lot of money to pay Microsoft for their copyrights, paying all these royalties, then that means other things equal, the dollar is going to be higher than it would otherwise be. I don't want a higher dollar, I want a lower dollar. What would you do for about China? I'm glad you said just asked that, John, because we actually, have, we actually have a big report coming in about four weeks that talks about what China's doing and the fundamental shift that China's undergone in the last four or five years away from an FDI attraction model to what's called an indigenous innovation model. But it really goes to this to this point where, where this is, I think, where Dean and I fundamentally disagree. And, and this is where I disagree with the neoclassicalists on trade. Because the neoclassicalists, uh, they're all for more trade because of what they call allocation efficiency. 
So if we can produce wheat a uh, little, little we, we're better at wheat and the Chinese are better at, at widgets, then we do more wheat, they do more widgets, and everybody's great. But what the trade theory completely ignores is the impact on, of trade on innovation and productivity. You can make a very, very good case. In fact, Boston Consulting Group, before they wrote this recent study, which was, to me, not very good, the prior study, which completely contradicted their new study, by the way. It's great when you're a consulting firm, you can say these things and nobody notices. Uh, their prior study actually was very interesting because what it said is that the Chinese efforts to keep down their prices of their exports through currency manipulation, through subsidies, through forced wage suppression, that that had a negative effect on global productivity, which is absolutely right. Because what it meant was that you can now, instead of building something in the U.S. and using a machine to build it, you go to China and you have hand labor assembly. That is not helping the global economy. Now, that may be some sort of strange allocation efficiency thing going on, but that directly lowers global productivity because it lowers the use of machines. So, in that sense, Dean, I don't agree with you that, that somehow the gains from trade, I mean, if you look at the gains from trade, they're so, so small. The allocative efficiency gains from, I mean, you, I don't know whether you pointed out or EPI's pointed this out, looking at the Peterson Institute studies, they're, they're really, really small. The gains are going to come from how trade affects productivity and, and innovation, not this allocation, whether you're producing wheat or producing widgets. So that's where I just don't think it makes any difference. You know, if the, if the Mexicans want to be our doctors, uh, it's not. You know, maybe there's some allocation efficiency there, but it's pretty small. The real question is, how do we get a healthcare system that's much more innovative, much more productive? Doctors using health IT. I guarantee you, by the way, Mexican doctors are going to use less health IT than American doctors. Now, American doctors don't use very much of it, uh, which is a failure of policy more than anything else. But in theory, they should because they have higher wages and therefore will adopt more machines. Is that okay with you? Um, yeah, I'll carry it a step further. I mean, what I actually wrote about for drugs, I'd write the same thing for medical equipment, that this also should be sold in a, in a, in a free market. Um, and one of the reasons we don't use as much IT in, or use it as well as we should is because it's patent protected and you have very exorbitant prices. So when you go to, you know, get an MRI, it's $3,000, $5,000. The thing's sitting there. It doesn't cost them $3,000, $5,000 to use it. What we should want is that if that's good, you know, if that's the best scanning equipment for you and you think you need it, you should use it because what does it cost? You know, you have to have the, you know, the electricity, you have to have the technician, maybe the doctor looks at it, it's 50 bucks, 100 bucks, you know, uh, parceling out their time. Um, so we have incredibly inefficient medical, use of medical technology, again, because of the patent system there. Um, so again, I would put that along with prescription drugs, pay for that up front, we'd have much more efficient health care. And yeah, again, I think, you know, if we could save $100 billion a year on our doctors, there's very few policies I could think of that would have that much benefit for the country. Um, I'm all for that, and I don't know any reason whatsoever why we think Mexican doctors wouldn't be every bit as good as U.S. doctors. The whole point would be you'd make them train to U.S. standards. So I don't see a downside. I think we can open it up for questions from, from the audience. If anybody would like to weigh in. Yes. Uh, this is a question for Rob. Um, so you began your talk, your 15-minute talk, by describing um, the post-war years as being uh, a time when productivity increased. And correct me if I mischaracterize it, but because of lack of international competition. Um, could you expand a bit on why there's a connection between the best productivity growth in most of our lives and um, lack of competition from Japan or Europe? Uh, if I, if that's what you heard, then I, uh, if I, I was mistaken, then I wasn't trying to link those two things. I was saying there, there were two dynamics going on that I think are central to this question uh, in the post-war period. One was. You know, the golden age of productivity and wage growth, 3% a year, essentially, on, on pretty much both of those factors. And at the same time, there wasn't a lot of productivity going, uh, there wasn't a lot of international competitiveness. So you didn't really have to worry whether the U.S. corporate tax rate was the second highest in the world at a statutory level. Uh, you didn't worry about that because companies largely weren't going somewhere. Companies that wanted to move in the U.S., they'd move from Michigan to South Carolina and it's faced the same U.S. corporate rate. So that was my point. Uh, you could make an argument either way for this connection to productivity. On the one hand, more competition from you know, Japan and Germany induces U.S. firms to be more productive. They, they, they have to compete. 
And I think the way to think about competition is essentially a U-shaped curve. Um, too much competition actually lowers productivity. And we, I think that's exactly what we're saying. That's another reason why I really don't like what China's doing. When you're competing against a country where there is just the, 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 the subsidies are so great, you can't meet them. It doesn't matter how productive you are in the U.S. for certain types of goods. It doesn't matter. You can be as productive as you want. You still can't beat the China price because of massive export subsidies, wage suppression, currency manipulation, and a whole set of other things. So I think what we really want to strive for to get sort of maximal productivity is, uh, if you will, sort of market-based competition. You don't want to shield people from competition, but you also want to prevent uh, unfair uh, and subsidized competition. In other words, you sort of want market-based competition. And in that sense, I do think that perhaps we might have even had higher productivity after the post-war period. Uh, because there were certain sectors like autos that was you know, pretty sheltered from competition and, and could have done more and better. Well, are you worried about the same threat from Japan in the, in the late 1980s? Uh, no, in, in, in a, partially, but I think there's two big differences between Japan and China. Um, first of all, one is size. Um, uh, China is just much bigger, will continue to be much bigger. Um, the second thing is China up until now has really, their strategy has been as, 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 a, as a sort of uh, FDI export platform. FDI comes in, exports go out. That wasn't really the Japanese strategy. Uh, the Japanese strategy was more of a, of a, you know, they were competing with our companies. And uh, so there was a little bit of that going on. But it went, the, the, the amount of subsidization that the Chinese are engaged in, I think, is significantly higher, as well as just being a bigger economy. You didn't have U.S. firms opening factories in Japan and using hand assembly. I mean, this Boston Consulting Group study was interesting because they actually said for the first time there are products that have evolved over 50 years life cycle in the U.S. to be designed the way they actually design the parts and the products to be machine assembled. And they're redesigning these products now for hand assembly because just it's why buy a machine when you can pay somebody 45 cents an hour? Uh, that's not a good thing. Uh, now, if maybe their natural wages are 45 cents an hour, okay, but the real wages on a dollar denominated basis are probably more like two bucks an hour. If you take away all the subsidy, you take away the currency, and then, then you get a very different dynamic between hand assembly and machine assembly. Machine assembly makes more sense. Well, I'd be a little skeptical, well, not being an expert in that, but I would be, the issue I want to look at is what else those people be doing in China. But that aside, um, you know, in terms of the U.S. economy, you know, I think obviously we do face an issue with China. Again, I think the currency is front and center, but obviously specific industries, solar, the, the subsidies they have there make it almost impossible to compete. So, you know, what I would say is, A, you know, focus on the currency, but B, you know, certainly in specific sectors, you know, clearly there are issues where they're very heavily subsidized and, you know, we have to get some sort of quid pro quo. If you want to subsidize this, we're going to subsidize that, whatever. Ideally, you know, you limit subsidies in both directions. I, you know, I think it does make sense for us to, you know, President Obama's agenda, have subsidies for, you know, some high-tech sectors, for solar, for wind. I think that makes good sense given where we are and, you know, there needs to do something about global warming. But again, you know, that in principle is something we should be able to negotiate. Any other questions? Steve? Yes. Um, actually, Rob, I have one for you. Um, to the point about um, entitlements and um, social welfare, is there not a growth element to that? Because, I mean, you're not only redistributing when millions of people have more money, don't they go out and spend it? On products, services, and so that that has a growth effect. I mean, because aren't they putting money into the economy? And yeah. So no, the answer is no. Um, this is, I think, a common fallacy that a lot of people have bought into. This kind of lump of labor fallacy. If, 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 you, if you take that away, well, reality. If you take that away, it goes somewhere else. It doesn't go under. It doesn't get hidden under a bed. Uh, that money is spent somewhere else. So that's, that's the same argument people use against, uh, even the president has made this argument that we have unemployment because of uh, going to the airport and using a kiosk uh, to check into your, get, get your boarding pass. Uh, what happens in that dynamic is the boarding, the, the airline ticket essentially costs, you know, 10 cents less because you're not using a person, you're using a machine. You don't put that 10 cents under the mattress. You, you take that 10 cents and you go spend it. You buy a cup of coffee or you go on a vacation. You, know, you accumulate all those 10 cents around the world. 
And so this notion somehow that if we don't kind of give people money, it won't get spent, I just think is fallacious. Where it is right is in a recession, when you're under capacity and consumer and investment, but consumer and C and I uh, don't keep up the level. G, in other words, government has to has to make up the gap. Absolutely, but when, once you're out of a recession, that I don't think that holds. Yeah, I would agree with that basic story. I will just comment on the you know the issue of retirement aging. Uh, you know, I think this has been hugely overplayed. I think in a lot of ways, deliberately by some people. Again, I'm not using Rob here, but a lot of people here in Washington basically are hostile to those programs, of Social Security and Medicare. If you look at the story, I mean, I always have a good time with these people. I've debated this a lot, so you may know I've written on this extensively, including a book on it. But if you look at the projections, you always get these people going, oh, my God, we've got three workers for every retiree today, and, you know, in 20 years or 25 years, we're going to have just two. Well, guess what? We had five 30 years ago, and we have better living standards today than we did 30 years ago. That's because of productivity growth. And, you know, if you back this out, suppose you're going to pay for Social Security entirely through the payroll tax, the increase in uh, the cost. It would take about one twentieth, uh, about five percent of the projected increase in wages over this period to cover, you know, the increase in, in uh, the projected increase in the, the retirement burden. Uh, Medicare is a qualitatively different story, and that's because we have a broken health care system. Um, and you know, people always lump those two together who want to go after Social Security. They say Social Security, and Medicare. I always go, yeah, fixing the street across the street in Medicare. Um, you know, it's Medicare. You know, let's just be honest, and that's health care. So we do absolutely need to fix our health care system. That really is a problem. The issue of an aging population, we've had an aging population, that's really not new. There's a little bit of a speed up in the next decade, next 15 years with the baby boomers retiring, but it's basically you know, the same story we've had. That's not going to make us poor. What will make us poor is a broken health care system that causes us to throw endless amounts of money in the garbage because, you know, again, we don't have anything to show for it. If we're all living long and really healthy, that'd be great, but that's not true. We don't have, we don't, we're, we're right near the bottom in terms of life expectancy and many other health outcomes. Yeah, I just I don't think it's going to make us poor in the sense of negative GDP growth. It just will make us grow more slowly. Yes, over here. Could you comment on the uh, education sector and the fact that uh, we really haven't had gains in productivity, and where automation or different kinds of stimuli could make a difference? Uh, Kathleen, I'm glad you asked that question. Actually, we're going to do it. We're doing an event in, in March or something on productivity in, in higher ed and, and the role of IT in doing that. Um, there's a wonderful um, uh, state, you know, a fr phrase called Bommel's disease, which is William Bommel. He said, you know, 100 years ago it took four people to play a string quartet. It still takes four people. Uh, I haven't raised the productivity of string quartets. In fact, actually, we have because I can listen to a string quartet on my iPod. But Education is sort of a bombless disease sector. It's 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 kind of a lot of personal uh, you know attention and the like. It's a little bit like medic, a little bit like healthcare. Harder to automate, but I don't think we've anywhere near explored the possibilities of IT based automation and healthcare. If you're looking at higher ed, I mean, why are we why are why are there three thousand microeconomics courses being lectured today? Uh, why don't we have four? And everybody just you know gets the the four best and and uh, you know uses them and then and then. You would redeploy those resources for much more intensive kinds of things that only faculty can do. But so I think there's a lot of things that IT could do. We just we 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 haven't had a serious policy. Even the even the president's uh, statement, which and the State of the Union, which I give him some credit, I give him credit for, uh, to finally look at kind of the cost side, not not the price side. It's the cost side that's the problem, not the price side. The price is because of the cost. Really want to address the cost side. You got to get down into the production system, and, and again, that's kind of that's where you know you look at progressive economics. They, they tend to focus on the price side, and they tend to say the way to fix that is with Pell grants and subsidies. Which again, I'm not saying that's bad, but it doesn't get at the production function, and that's what we've got to look at. Yeah, my guess is we are going to see some serious changes in higher education, whether we like it or not, just because, you know, you are getting a lot of schools that I think are pricing themselves out of the market. I mean, it probably is always going to be worth 50000 to send your kid to Harvard, but it may not to, you know, the schools of, you know, uh, Grinnell or something like that, you know, very good liberal arts school, but I don't know if you, you know, if you're trying to do a cost, you know, what does your kid get out of in terms of earnings potential? Uh, probably not that much more than the state university, um, and even the state university might be too expensive. So I think we are going to see some of the changes along the lines that Rob's talking about. But I, I don't know, you know, they're not going to be pretty. Um, I'm saying that because I guess I have a lot of friends who are faculty, you know, and, uh, you know, but uh, and in a lot of ways, I think there'll be aspects of education, the current system that will be lost. I went to a small liberal arts college. I thought it was very valuable. And, you know, maybe those won't exist or many, many fewer will. So 
there'll be aspects of that that I think are very likely to change. And, you know, it will mean large savings in terms of cost, but, uh, you know, some, some losses. One, one other thing I'll just say on that is, again, I'll get through on my inequality thing. I was sort of struck, you know, when we first went to the downturn, there were a lot of schools that were saying we're going to freeze faculty pay or even some cuts and this and that. And to show what good, I was going to say good guys, good people, most of them are men, uh, what good guys they were, uh, a lot of presidents, uh, university presidents said, oh, I'll take a pay cut too. And what really struck me was how much many of these people were paid. I mean, the president of Harvard gets, you know, whatever, a million bucks. That, that wasn't a surprise to me. But you had a lot of schools that were not Harvard, where you had people running them getting eight, 900000 I, I was a little surprised by that. Um, if you could get the cost of some of those administrators down, uh, that seems like a real waste. I can't believe you can't find a really good person to run a mid, mid, uh, mid-level mid university for three or 400000 I mean, then, then, so anyhow, so that's a, that's a cost and equality issue. So uh, uh, higher, uh, te- better technology makes higher education more accessible. Exactly. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, you, you, you disagreed a bit on automation and job destruction and, and job creation. Uh, isn't it the case if you take a product life cycle or a business life cycle perspective that at the mature end of a business life cycle, the innovation and productivity gains tend to destroy jobs? They create efficiencies. Uh, in an area where market demand is probably shrinking, there aren't as many firms, and the firms that survive need to survive with fewer and fewer workers. And so innovation really does destroy jobs. It frees workers up from mature sectors that have a, a shrinking future. On the other hand, at the front end of the product life cycle, or the business life cycle, where you have new technologies and new products and, and new potential, innovation generates the, the capability to create new industries and new products you know, and, uh, and create industries that move from the startup phase to the growth phase, you know, and at that end of the product life cycle, innovation is a job creator. So, you know, wouldn't it sort of reconcile the dispute to, you know, to acknowledge, on the one hand, that, that innovation destroys jobs at the mature end of the cycle, but it creates jobs, you know, at the startup end of the cycle? Well, the basic story is, you know, the relative uh, growth in demand versus growth in productivity. So if you're, you know, a mature, you know, we have a mature product, television sets. I mean, we can't, you know, everyone's got two, three, five, you know, you can't have too many more television sets. So if we have 5% speed up in, I I know all our television sets are made overseas, but let's imagine they're made in the United States. Let's say we have 5% increase in productivity growth in television sets, you know, maybe 1% increase in demand. Well, the arithmetic tells you we're going to have 4% fewer jobs. So that's exactly right. The other hand, with cell phones, you know, maybe, I don't know where we stand in terms of saturation, but in any case, iPods, you know, whatever, iPads, you know, they're products, new tech products where the demand probably would be growing faster productivity, so, you know, that is the story. Um, I I don't know if we're, we differ on this. I mean, I'm all for innovation and, you know, efficiencies. I want to make sure that the workers who lose their jobs can get reemployed, have, you know, a period of transition. You know, my models here would be countries like Denmark, Sweden, that, you know, have been very effective in retraining workers when they lose jobs in one sector, go to another sector, and I, I think that's what we should strive to do. So. Uh, you know, from my mind, I don't want to impede productivity. I just want to make sure that, you know, the people who are, you know, lose their jobs can, can go elsewhere. It's better for the economy and better for them. Does training fit in your model? Absolutely. I just want to make a point of what Steve, what you said is um, there's a widespread, I, I agree with your framing broadly, although I, some industries can come back. Uh, they, they're out on the product life cycle. They can actually, television is one of those, believe it or not. I, you know, we're going to now, we're getting into 3D. We're going to get into ultra HD. Uh, television actually isn't, isn't a mature industry. I but, still have an old one. In the yeah, <laughs> you got to get the 3D one. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty It's pretty cool. I've seen it. I, haven't, I don't have one yet. It makes my HD look like a piece of junk. Um, but the point there, I think, is is there's a lot of, con- a lot of popular conception that you know, there are a lot of articles that we can't afford automation now because, or productivity now because we don't have enough jobs. The reality is that, at least the economic evidence we've looked at and we've reviewed the literature pretty thoroughly, there's no correlation between high levels of productivity and increased joblessness. Now, there, there's some dispute about that in the short run, in the sort of zero to three year level. Some studies say there's no relationship, some studies say there is a relationship. But in the Beyond three years, the at least all the evidence we've looked at is there's no relationship. In fact, if there's a relationship, high productivity leads to more jobs because you get a, a virtuous cycle. So I see a lot of progressives, and I'm glad Dean is saying this, but I do see a lot of progressives that have this sort of anxiety. Can we afford productivity because there's this lump of labor, faculty workers are going to lose their jobs. 
On the training thing, absolutely. Uh, the Danish flex security model is a great model. We should adopt it. It's really an active labor market policy to help workers sort of before they lose their jobs. We have a terrible system in the U.S. Our unemployment insurance system is, 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 is really uh, very, uh, very bad. So we should do more of that. But, you know, Dean, you mentioned you wanna, don't want to impede productivity. I actually want to accelerate productivity. So I want to identify policies that get it even faster. I want to get back up to 3%, 3.5%. I don't think 2% is very good. And I do that through things like an investment tax credit on new machinery. I do it with a, we just did an event a couple weeks ago on the construction industry. We need a national construction productivity agenda uh, because the construction industry is anemic and a terrible productivity. And there's a lot of things the government can do as a smart buyer of construction to drive productivity. So I don't want to just Im not impede it and get in the way. I want to actually have an active policy to get more of it. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I, I think the current technological change is doing two things. One, increasing automation in a big way and not in one or two industries across the board, including services. And the second is outsourcing. And the, it seems to me that the impact of that, not just in the US, but all over the world, including China, by the way, a lot of automation is going on in China today. It's not reversing, it's opposite. And my worry is that really we don't have an answer to then the consequence of concentrated wealth and growing unemployment. And it seems that the model even in Europe is under attack along this line as well. Yes, you have broader social protection and so on, and it's very, more humane in my view, but at the same time, it's becoming very difficult even to sustain that. So I'm, I'm just wondering if we are really dodging the, the real problem. Do we have an answer to this? Is it something that requires new, fresh thinking about perhaps, I don't know, reducing work hours, uh, finding ways of uh, more innovative ways for this? I don't think the innovation per se uh, answer the question because it's innovation for who? I mean, you have a lot of innovation in the United States, uh, but frankly, it doesn't produce jobs these days. And so, so the question is really, given these broader trends, both enabled by new technologies, both for outsourcing as well as for automation across the board. What can be done to really have a, a more healthy society, not just concentrated wealth? Well, let me start on that one. First off, in the case of Europe, you know, I think they've done absolutely harebrained macroeconomic policies. You know, as much as I might criticize President Obama and his ina inadequate stimulus, I mean, they're going the opposite way, and they somehow think there's going to be virtue in austerity. And then, uh, I'm supposed to have lunch with uh, someone from uh, the German parliament next weekend, dying to ask me, well, tell me, how does that work? You're cutting back government spending, your, your economy's in a tailspin. Who is going to invest? How does that work? How do you get that demand made up? I don't even know what they're thinking, so I'm dying to hear that. Um, so I, I don't think that's something intrinsic to the model. I think that's intrinsic to the European Central Bank being, you know, just on another planet. Um, you know, that, so, so they are pushing that economy into a downturn. But, you know, more generally, you know, the, the issues you raise, I mean, we want to make sure that everyone benefits from the gains from innovation. Um, shorter hours, I think, is a great thing. And, of course, in, in Europe, they've gone that route. So if you look at the average work year in the United States, it's 20, 25 percent longer than it is in Europe. Uh, Western Europe. And in fact, one of the great stories people like to hold up Germany is, you know, this great model that, you know, they, their unemployment rate, I, I just saw today, it fell, I think it's 5.4, 5.3 percent. It's about one and a half percentage points below what it was at the start of the downturn. It's like, oh, its economy is just booming along. Well, guess what? Its economy's grown less in this upturn than the U.S. economy. The reason why their unemployment rate's fallen is that they've encouraged firms to work workers shorter hours rather than lay them off. Great policy. You know, let's share the gains of productivity by having more leisure time. You know, it's absolutely standard in Europe, in fact, to be part of the European Union, all workers have to be guaranteed four weeks a year of vacation. In many countries, my wife's Danish, they had a general strike a few years back because they wanted six weeks vacation. They sell them five and a half and now they have six. Um, you know, so, so we want to make sure that people get the benefits of productivity growth and that is a really big problem. The flip side, the great concentrations of wealth, I mean one of the points I, I, I make in my book, the loser liberalism, I think in most cases you could find policies that have caused the wealth to be steered upwards. Um, you know, patents is a real good example. You know, Bill Gates is really rich because 
government will arrest people who don't, uh, you know, who use Windows without sending them a check. Um, you know, I think it's bad for, I hurt, think that policy hurts productivity growth, and it also leads to much greater concentration. Um, our CEOs get, you know, way more in pay than they do in Europe. Are they better than the European CEOs or the Japanese? Are you hard-pressed to see that. I mean, just from a narrow perspective, increasing stock price, you know, was our CEO at GM who took it to bankruptcy better than the ones who are running uh, cars, car companies in Europe? Uh, you know, again, I'm being a little crude here. He didn't take it in bankruptcy. He got hit by, you know, the worst downturn in 70 years. But I think he'd be hard-pressed to say that, you know, he was worth so much more than his counterparts in Europe and Japan, but he was getting paid, you know, perhaps five, ten times as much. That has to do with corporate governance policy. And, again, that's not the market. Uh, we have rules on corporate governance. Uh, they just have the effect of leaving CEOs largely setting their own pay because they appoint the directors who then determine their pay. And I always say, you know, if I were sitting on Exxon with, you know, however many hundreds of billions of dollars and I had all my friends deciding my pay, I hope they'd give me lots of money too. You know, but that's basically the story. So I think we have to look at the institutions that, on the one hand, prevent most people from getting the gains from growth, which, you know, I think Europe's done a much better job, and if we can fix the ECB, I think they will continue to, and two, uh, allowing for great concentrations uh, of wealth and income that have nothing to do with their, their product, you know, their productive value of the economy. Again, if someone's really productive, fine, you know, give a baseball player who's a great player and people want to watch, or an artist, musician, but that's not true with most of these people. So a couple things on, on the one, I, I agree with Dean. Actually, I would I would like to have mandatory, uh, uh, you know, vacation policy in the U.S. I do think we work too much, and uh, but I don't see that as a way to redistribute the gains. I mean, the gains of productivity still go to workers; they just go to workers in the form of lower prices. Uh, so I, I'm leaving that aside. I think I think we do work too much, and I would and and it's a sort of prisoner's dilemma. You know, how do you get more labor, free leisure time? Because if you want it, then your employer doesn't like it. Also, that's a societal choice that you have to make. Uh, but somehow to say that lower work hours would lead to higher employment to me is the same fallacy as saying that when somebody gets replaced by automation, it leads to lower unemployment. It just simply the French don't have lower unemployment because they work 35 hours a week. You get a little bit of a bump up immediately, and then consumers have less money because they're working less, and therefore they spend less, and so forth. unemployment stays exactly the same. So that can't be the solution. It can be a solution in a downturn. I get that, but not in a full employment economy. The second thing is um, <coughs> one of the things, uh, criticisms I have of, of, the, of progressive economics is that you, you hear this all the time. We need to focus on redistribution. We need to focus on corporations and, and, and wealthy individuals. I'm like, no, we need to focus on wealthy individuals. I mean, Romney got mocked in Iowa, but Romney actually was right when he said, money flows through corporations to individuals. If we're worried about inequality, we need to raise the taxes on high wage individuals. We need to raise the taxes on dividend income back to regular income. So I support all of that. Dean, I support raising the marginal rate on individuals from 35 up higher. I just don't think we should be conflating corporations with individuals. If we worried about that, let's deal with it on the individual side. Last point on the outsourcing thing is we would not have a problem on, 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 on kind of jobs from technology and innovation if we simply didn't run a trade deficit. The reason we run trade deficits, uh, the most massive trade deficits in world history of any country, is two reasons. One is the currency is the reserve currency and the U.S. government won't do anything to lower it. And the second is egregious mercantilist practices in countries like China and Brazil and Russia, and, and that we don't have our, a competitiveness policy of our own. But if we did all those things, we would create a lot of jobs, a lot of jobs in technology and manufacturing and other areas. Uh, so then I, I don't think we would, have, we would have to worry about that. So I don't think there's anything inherent. We've got to change the model and globalization is inherently leads to harm in the U.S. It's because we don't have the right kind of globalization. That's, that's where the harm comes from. Should we try for one more? Yes, in the back. <clears throat> yeah, um, well, first, thank you. Uh, I'm not an economist, and it was really helpful to see the different nuances. But I have sort of a really fundamental question, and I apologize if you already answered it. But it seems to me that that you both are supportive of economic growth, and it's, and, and, and one of the distinctions is the, the degree to which that's important is if it's the first or second priority. But it's both really important to both of your schools of thought. And so my question is, what do you call uh, you know, economists or people who, who uh, many of whom are worried about like global warming and environmental degradation in general, what do you call people who think we should have like no growth? I mean, they're not saying we shouldn't have innovation or anything like that, but that just having 
economic growth as a metric isn't a good societal goal. Uh, I mean, is that even economics, or I mean, what what is that called? I mean, that seems to me that that's that's sort of a. a dip, what do you label that? Well, I wouldn't say growth is an end in itself, but you know, other things equal. I generally would want more growth than less growth. But I think some of this. You know, there's, there's this conflation of growth with, uh, with resource use, and it does not have to be resource using, it can be resource saving. And just, you know, sort of a simple example, you know, in, in the old days, if you want to have, well, we do an economic conference, I guess, say business conferences, but okay, every year, you know, we have economic conferences. You know, this year was in Chicago, so you have thousands of people fly from around the country, around the world. Well, that uses a lot of resources. Suppose we could do the same sort of thing with telecommuting, um, use much less resources. Um, so I don't, you know, you know, I know in general there's a correlation between growth and and, GD, and resource use, but it's not one to one. In fact, it's been weakening. And you know, obviously, I, you know, at least in my view, I'd make it a strong priority to weaken that further. But you know, going a step beyond that, you know, you know, and I don't mean to say Rob would necessarily disagree. That he could say for himself, you know, we care about people's lives, and if people opt for more leisure. You know, so that they don't, you know, we're, we're getting more productive and rather than buying more things, they'd rather have more vacation, have shorter work weeks. I think that's great. You know, I'm not going to tell them that they have to work, you know, have to work the same number of hours so we could have growth. So, you know, I, I think more in terms of, you know, output per hour, you know, if we could produce in 20 hours what we used to produce in 40, to my mind, that's fantastic. You know, we end up producing just the same amount because people go up and we don't need more. You know, we'd rather have the time. Um, I don't, I don't really see a downside to that. Yeah, it's really depressing to me that I'm agreeing with Dean as much as I am. Because <laughs> I 100% agree, growth is not, GDP is not the metric. Uh, you could have lower GDP with more leisure, and, and you're just as well off, if not better off, if people choose that. It, it's exactly as Dean said, it's productivity that matters, and productivity and innovation. So I don't care whether, uh, I actually think we take too much of it in products and services, and we should take more of it in leisure. But leaving that aside, um, you know, even if we do that, I'm, by the way, to answer your question, what do you call people who say that? The, uh, the answer is Luddites. Um, that's what you call them. Uh, because fundamentally, you, you, I, I actually had a debate with somebody. Uh, um, uh, she wrote, uh, she's at Maryland, she wrote this book. Uh, I'm not thinking of her name. But I said, my goal of, of a kind of a, from, a, from how do we want the global economy to evolve? So I want every Indian people in India. I want every Indian to have an American middle class living standard in 40 or 50 years. That's my goal. And she was aghast because, oh, this was going to hurt the climate. I'm like, so we're going to basically protect the climate to, by keeping people in, in, in dire impoverishment. And in our view, what we, what we say at ITF is you don't have to make that trade-off. The trade, the, what the goal should be is much higher growth, particularly in low-income countries with a dramatic transformation from a carbon-based economy. And, and that only will come about through innovation and only with growth. If you have growth, you're willing to put a little bit of resources into R&D and deployment and get these new technologies to emerge. But somehow the fact that we can save the planet by cutting our incomes 10%, uh, you know, that's just not a realistic solution. And nor is it a fair solution. I mean, the other thing people forget, it's easy to forget in Washington, the average American makes, uh, what, $48,000? Yeah. That's not very much money. You know, anybody in this room want to live on forty-eight thousand dollars? I want every American to be making a hundred thousand or a hundred and fifty thousand. You know, I want them to be able to go on vacation and afford a, you know, afford a better car and you know, send their kid to college. So we just can't, we just can't sort of say that that you know, impoverishment is the solution to climate change. We got to figure out a better solution than that, and I think that comes from innovation. Okay, well, thank you all very much for coming. This has been a great debate. It's good to. Uh, I hope we can get this into the presidential election campaign and let people uh, hear these solutions to, to the economy. Thank you, John. Thank you.